welcome and also welcome to those who uh, will join us later, I'm guessing um, over watching the video series too. People come and reference the classes over and over and that's a good way to catch up on some of this, the details that you might have missed during the class. And um, this time it's gonna be primarily myself presenting because um, I'm the main um, household mm -hmm. fermenter. Um, <laughs> And Alexia was the, uh, presented the last time with tomatoes and what to do with tomatoes and how to preserve canned dry tomatoes, which is an awesome one to check out on the video. And then next time with the... Gizzard giblets and bones, oh my, making amazing bone broths from any uh, small creatures that cross your path. For instance, chickens, uh, rabbits are the main ones that we use here. So just a little bit about bone broth, really fall nourishing uh, broths and soups using the whole animal. So if you want to stay for just a moment, I'd love to share just a couple minutes of backstory. And if I'm going too long, give me a hand signal or something. Because <laughs> sometimes I get so stoked about our story. And uh, I just wanted to share a little bit of background how we got into homesteading and what we've done with it and uh, some possibilities and potential by way of inspiration for you all. We, in about uh, 2011 or 2010, Alexia and I met in person and um, had a wonderful trans cascade romance, we call it, of, of shared food from, from elk to chicken eggs to cabbages and all sorts of, um, all sorts of sharing food across the mountain range. And we had this inspiration from a young student of ours who's, who was 15 at the time who did a challenge to feed himself only wild foods for an entire month so that he could save the family some food budget and send himself to summer camp where I was working. And I was just so inspired by that, like this 15 year old just um, having so much connection with food and with wildlands in his neighborhood in Idaho that I said, Alexia, what if we just tried doing a little bit of that um, right now, today. Pop mm -hmm. quiz, let's see what we could come up with that we um, have a full story of to feed ourselves over the next two days. And so we um, scrounged, uh, scrounged the, the pantry and the freezers and the, and the yards gardens. and the gardens mm -hmm. at Alexia's place and we came up with a chicken and some corn and some a uh, few bean, dried beans and some wild tea. And we fed ourselves pretty well for two days. We're like, that was fun. Let's try it a little bit more next year. And so then the next year we did it for two weeks, but we prepared ahead of time and got collected and harvested and grew. And pretty soon the experiment grew um, momentum. And the next year we were doing a month. And then the next year it was a month plus a week out of every season. And pretty soon in 2016, it was three quarters of the year we were spending eating only food that we had um, full stories of, um, either given to us from our friends or that we wild harvested or grew or foraged ourselves. And so as it grew, the yards changed in our um, household and our connection and relationships with the beings that are feeding us all the time changed. Mm -hmm. So we really had connection with apple trees and goats and rabbits and chickens and ducks and horses and beans and um, rose hips from the wild and elderberry and cattail and when are things in season and when is the right time to harvest it? How do you preserve so you can make it through the winter on what you can grow or forage? And through that exploration over six, seven years, we built a repertoire of skills to feed ourselves from this land and also relationships really. It's not about like we're so skilled and and awesome, it's about the relationships actually with our friends and neighbors, with the plants and animals themselves as allies, with the soil as the fundament of nutrition, with the seasons and the cycles of eating from a landscape, um, fresh, whole, nourishing, real food. And so over this series of classes, we're just sharing some of the things we've learned over the last decade, because our next challenge has been how many people can we feed from this place and from, um, the regenerative um, design we can implement on our farm here. Mm -hmm. So with that, I guess we'll, unless you want to add anything else. No, that sounds 
That sounds good. It's been a really fun journey. And I just want to emphasize the relationship piece that Daniel mentioned, because we went all of 2017 without exchanging any money for food and like zero grocery stores. Some people said, oh my gosh, are you losing weight? Like, are you eating tree bark? And I was like, no, we're eating goat cheese omelets actually because we've had enough time to prepare and because people are so excited to share food with us. You know, a friend in Hawaii sends us macadamia nuts and, you know, somebody brings us trout. I mean, it's just really nice to have that, um, have those connections. So just, I just encourage you to look around your neighborhood and see what's growing and imagine the possibilities. So grow, growing a lifestyle, one small change at a time, one week at a time, one meal at a time is what we're advocating. Um, so fermenting, uh, we run into this possibility in our region, in, in our um, climate and really anywhere, but especially places where there's a, a specific growing season like Western Washington where we're, where we're at, and then a winter time where there's not food growing, um, how do we preserve the harvest? And so today we wanted to share a little bit about fermenting because I got really excited about eating um, fresh uh, sauerkraut after um, some friends of mine offered me some sauerkraut and I tasted it and I was like, wow, my whole body's like kind of zinged with aliveness. Like, there's something in here that I really need. And I don't really know the names of all of, all of the processes and all of the beings that are that are interacting to create a ferment. I'm sure somebody does, and there's great books about that. I, I just call all of those um, fermenting beings the little people. And mm -hmm. the little people do a lot of work here on Hawthorne Farm. Like there's a trillion little people in my body, uh, that, um, beneficial bacteria and um, helping me digest food and get nutrition out of it. And in, um, in sauerkraut fermenting, it's a lacto, ferment or lactobacilli are the main stars, superstars of that process. And um, here's a jar of it. This is a jar of ginger um, sauerkraut that I made in, in the summertime in uh, July. Um, there are um, hundreds of thousands of little bacteria stars in here that are gaining nutrition from this um, food, this living food and offering by byproducts that, that actually um, are more nutritious in some cases, in a lot of cases, than the raw vegetable themselves. Um, I love eating raw cabbage too, but they're awesome in there. And so um, my point is there's a lot of little people and I don't know all their names, but I give them, I give them a deep bow of respect because as one writer pointed out, they are our ancestors. <laughs> the, the, you know, life started with bacteria. So um, here's what I do for making a batch of sauerkraut. I'd love to take you outside, but it's pouring rain here today. And so we're just gonna have to stick inside on this one. But I actually just taught a sauerkraut class the last three hours of today in person live. Um, and so I have some leftovers and some um, of the material in the process. But um, number one, I recommend starting with really fresh, delicious, um, locally grown food like that you could grow yourself or that you could get from a local farmer or you could go down to 21 Acres Market and buy. Um, but starting with the freshest food um, produces the best ferment. And um, when I first started, I was getting 50 pound boxes of cabbage from a bulk ordering company. And then I started making relationships with local farmers and buying that. Um, and then after that, I started growing cabbage until I learned like a cabbage actually needs really fertile soil and three feet of space to grow into its full um, expression of itself. And if it stops raining, I'll take you out to the cabbage patch at the end. Um, but, so we start with fresh food and all you need for, for sauerkraut is a cabbage. We've got a question about uh, the types of cabbage from yeah. Olga. We, um, Olga shares, hi, I've heard it's best to use a fall or flat kind of cabbage for fermenting. Could you comment on this and recommend? And then where to get? One could... more time. Oh, sorry. Can, can you hear me? My camera or my microphone is weird sometimes. <laughs> 
Yeah, I didn't catch the first part of the question. Say it again. Okay. Um, Olga heard it is best to use a fall or flat kind of cabbage for fermenting. So um, some of the summer cabbages that have been bred for summertime harvest for like coleslaw and raw cabbage are sweeter and um, more tender. They work fine for fermenting and we make sauerkraut out of them. Um, but also certain cabbages have been bred um, for thicker, hardier leaves and are like better for storage. And those make great cabbages for sauerkraut. Mm -hmm. And there's also certain varieties that have been bred for larger sizes and easier shapes mm -hmm. for making sauerkraut, like Filderkraut from Germany, um, which also make great cabbage. But in my experience, any cabbage that I've ever tried worked for making sauerkraut. And I can't say that I took detailed enough notes to say which ones work better. But um, most of the ferments that I make are in the fall, so that ends up being fall cabbages, yes. Thank you so much. Do you okay. want to add anything to that? So t I, I already pre-harvested uh, a beautiful ruby cabbage from the garden uh, a couple days ago when I was making a big batch of kraut. And there's a little bit left of another green one. Um, so I start off with a really uh, fresh, raw, beautiful head of cabbage. And I like to um, harvest them into a crate, all my veggies into a crate, um, like a black crate, could you grab that? And then I spray them off in the garden so that the dirt and the um, slugs and the worms stay in the garden um, if possible. So it's a crate like that that's, that's um, uh, broad enough so I can spray and flip, spray and flip. and. So I've got some carrots and beets that I harvested yesterday and today, respectively. And those are also in a crate and they've been sprayed off and the tops left in the gardens or fed to the goats and rabbits. Um, so have a milk crate, spray veggies off in the garden. Uh, if a lot of you are probably gonna be, maybe you're gonna be buying cabbages from the store um, and they're just gonna come like this. So we'll start right there. So I like to um, I like to chop the um, stem off, and you may want to change to filming mode here. Mm -hmm. um, split it in half, and I like to take the core out because it ends up being pretty fibrous. So I just pop the core out with a nice Ooh. diagonal cut. We switch the camera. There we go. I pop the core out with a nice diagonal cut. It's also edible, very tasty actually. Um, but we also feed them to the goats and rabbits. So my cabbage looks like that. Pop the core out. And um, this ferments at a different rate than the thin sliced cabbage. So um, sometimes I will just use a grater and grate it. And if it looks really fibrous or it's like a summer cabbage that went too long and it's too fibrous, I just give it to the goats and rabbits. They're happy to process it and make goat milk out of it. Or there it's shredded nicely. So I got my cabbage, and if you're at home, if you're doing this home scale, you could just use a nice sharp knife, and um, and you could just make thin slices, as thin as you can make it, without cutting your fingertips, but nice and thin, and I usually do it. It's going to end up about that that length right there, nice and thin. Or you can use a what's called a mandolin or a slicing implement. Oh, there's the blades. It's got the flat blade, straight blade, and the serrated blade. So this is a small, like, personal kitchen size mandolin. 
and it also slices pretty quickly, but be careful of the blade. Usually they have a little guard on top. I'm demonstrating this quickly because I'm not going to do the whole thing. And then if you go into like production mode as we do, so we produce um, about 40 gallons or 50 gallons a year of sauerkraut. So we're doing a lot of sauerkraut. That's about seven or eight five gallon crocs full of sauerkraut every year. We get into production mode. So we use this larger three blade mandolin with a wooden guard. And I've already sliced 60 pounds of cabbage today with this, so it's a little wet from washing it. And you can take larger chunks of cabbage and use the guard. You can see that's a lot quicker. So a couple of tips for using this one or any of them is to have your receptacle underneath your, your um, slicing implement and to keep your fingers clear <laughs> of the blade. Use the, safety, um, use the safety mechanisms. I have enough scars to <laughs> prove that it doesn't work to ignore the safety mechanisms. So you see, this is really quick. I'm going to put, just so you can see that you can just throw in whatever size pieces of cabbage. scale unless you're a very serious fermenter and all of your family or your extended family or community really like to eat sauerkraut which is the case here mm -hmm. we have 10 people living here and so we'll eat half a gallon in a week or sometimes a full gallon in a week so we have to go through this much um, cabbage but if you're doing it home scale which many of you probably are um, you know one cabbage head um, between five and seven pounds, which is about the size I showed you of cabbage, will be enough to make a gallon of kraut, which is what I'm gonna show you today, just um, so it's the most useful um, size batch for you. So we've got, um, we've got the cabbage shredded. I'm just gonna do the last little bit of it here. And, um, you could stop right there and you can make great sauerkraut with just cabbage. And I love sauerkraut with just plain, simple cabbage. There's something about the cabbage plant. Is that Brassica oleraceae? Mm -hmm. Variety cabbage. Mm -hmm. There's something about the cabbage plant that just lends itself miraculously to fermenting well. And um, like, Broccoli, which is also Brassica oleraceae, but it's the flower tops, that doesn't work really well for fermenting. It smells like old feet, um, old socks or something like that. But there are certain veggies that really lend themselves well to fermenting, and for some reason, cabbage is that, is, is that veggie. And um, so all of my sauerkrauts, you know, sauerkraut is a German word for this kind of ferment with cabbage. All of mine have cabbage and usually at least a third cabbage per, um, per batch. Also, you could add other vegetables to it. And so today I'm gonna, I'm gonna add an, one, uh, for this much sauerkraut, I'm gonna add one to two onions, depending on their size, one to two carrots and one large beet. 
I'm gonna mix all that together and then add a little bit of ginger. So this is gonna be a mixed veggie kraut I'm gonna demo today. So you could start with the cabbage and just do it like that or you could add more veggies like so. So you're, um, we just harvested um, 300 pounds of, of fall storing carrots yesterday and um, before the big fall rains hit and we are, um, we've separated out the ones that are like eat soon, like the, um, the ones with little cracks in them or, you know, little, uh, little scuffs that aren't going to store very well. And the rest are stored in sand right now. Um, and uh, so I'm going to take a few of these eat soon carrots, wash the dirt off, and then just take off the um, the parts that don't look as good to as yummy to eat, like the green tops. Of course, that's all going to go to the rabbits too, or to the compost pile. For the soup stock. Or to the soup stock first. Nothing to waste. And those look pretty good, those sizes. Okay, so I think I'm gonna do about that much carrot. Maybe one more. I wonder while you're chopping if now might be a good time for anyone who has questions. Sure. Good. I have a question. <laughs> can I give one more detail first? Oh, absolutely. So that I can start shredding. So there are a variety of different sizes of um, graters. And I find I have preferences for what size each veggie ends up being in the finished kraut based on um, how quickly that veggie ferments. So for the beets, I use the medium size. For ginger, I use the fine size. And for carrots, I use this, um, this larger size, which is an antique, which was found at an antique store. This is a great, great grater. <laughs> um, so yeah, go ahead and ask your question and I'll, I'll just be over here grading. Um, that's a really beautiful find, a great grader. That's awesome. <laughs> um, so it sounds like for cabbage ever, or sorry, for sauerkraut, um, everything is a root vegetable. Are there any, is that kind of the common theme is always root vegetables or uh, besides cabbage and? Um, no, not necessarily, actually. Um, you know, the, the only other um, kind of large vegetable that I use actually, yeah, I think it is mostly root vegetables, is kohlrabi which is a swollen stem vegetable. It's also brassica oleracea. I didn't know that. Awesome. Thank you. Anyone so, else has I don't think so, but if anyone else has questions, please feel free to share in the chat. Mm -hmm. Fingertips. Care for your fingertips. Do the very tip slowly on these sharp graters. So you're going to find um, through experimentation, if you try this enough, what, how many veggies you like in your ratio. And by now, having done this for a decade and making 50 pounds a year and just trying different ratios and different veggies and different spices, I'll give you my list in a second. It's all written up on the whiteboard. Um, you're going to find your favorite ratio for how much of each veggie you want. And I would, I would encourage, um, if you're, if you're serious about trying this, there are, um, so many different combinations and spices. And if you go to a local, um, local farm store, like 21 acres, or you go to the local co-op, there are lots of different varieties. I mean, people doing stuff like putting fruit in there and turmeric and, all sorts of stuff I'd never put in there, but I think it's worth trying and seeing what flavor combinations and um, texture combinations, color combinations you like. I think that um, food should be colorful and really beautiful. Like there's no real, there's no reason to eat ugly food. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so that's about the amount of carrots that I, I want to do for this batch of um, one, and that's probably about seven pounds of uh, cabbage. And that's probably about two, three pounds of carrots. So those two are together and I'm going to get a beet in there too. So for the beets, after we've cut the beet tops off, I really like to take some of that tough, um, thick skin off the top of the beet. And um, you could peel it if you want, but I don't think it's necessary. And scrape some of the hairy root parts off. Um, again, we can use those in soup stock and we can use those in, um, or for rabbit food or goat food. So I'm not feeling like it's going into waste. And again, like I said, this grater is my favorite shred size for the beet. The colors are so gorgeous. I just had to interject. Mm. That's they're so beautiful. You're right. <laughs> mm. So dark and gorgeous. And it smells awesome. Vibrant color. I'm actually. What, what is it that you taught me about the color of food and the nutrition, Alexia? You said that the purple veggies, like purple potatoes and purple cabbage, have a different. Um, nutritional profile mm -hmm. than their lighter colored counterparts or different mm -hmm. colored counterparts. Yep. More anthocyanins. Okay, so there we got our beets. That's probably maybe three quarters of a pound of beet. I don't like to go too heavy on the beets. They're they're strong, strong food. Oh, look at that. That's beautiful. Uh, I used to, I, I like to use a nice big tub so that there's plenty of room to do the mixing when we're going to do the mixing. We're not quite to mixing mode yet. My favorite um, off farm ingredient to put in sauerkraut is ginger. I just find the, the flavor and the heat of it and the immune boosting properties um, just make it such a lovely flavor for a kraut. And I also have found through observation that kraut that has ginger in it seems to resist mold and other top growth, which I'll talk about in a bit, um, better. And also kraut that has some, some hot peppers in it, like a kimchi, also seems to resist mold growth better than um, just plain kraut for some reason. I'm not sure what that is, but. So you can peel your ginger with the back of a spoon to get the skin off, or you can just throw the skin in there. I, it's fine either way, I think. But in, in any case, after you buy it, it's probably good to wash it um, or peel it or both. This ginger has been washed and you can see that just scraping it, I'm peeling it, peeling that skin off. And this much ginger would be a nice strong ginger um, boost for this much kraut. So that's probably two, three ounces of ginger. Great right in there. Or I could do it in my little Wow, it's pouring rain outside. It is insane. I, I'm in Bothell, kind of near Woodenville, and it's like I I can't tell if it's thunder. Do you hear thunder? Yeah. <laughs> okay, then it's like is someone moving a truck? <laughs> <laughs> Have you, have you ever tried growing ginger? I have. I do grow ginger in the greenhouse, but awesome. not enough to keep up with Daniel's sauerkraut ambitions. <laughs> <laughs> I want to try to grow it soon. Oh. Yeah. I'm going to give the little lecture and leave this 
this um, board up for you so um, so you can refer to it again. So here's my sauerkraut 101. And I think some of the, the most important parts are first. So the ratios to remember, we have two to three tablespoons of salt to every five pounds of veggies. So in just a minute, I'm gonna mix the salt in with these veggies. And I've found that about eight pounds of veggies fit in a one gallon container. Eight gallons is how much a gallon of water, or how much, eight pounds is about how much a gallon of water weighs, so go figure. So eight pounds, maybe sometimes it's 10, maybe sometimes it's seven, um, fits in a one gallon container. So if you're trying to make a one gallon batch, just think about that buying about eight pounds of veggies or harvesting about eight pounds of veggies. And normally I'm making sauerkraut in 50 or in five gallon batches. So that's ending up to be about um, 50, 55 pounds of veggies are going in that five gallon crop, um, which is more like 10 pounds. Three pounds of cabbage max to a pound of other veggies. So, um, I like to have at least three to one ratio between the cabbages and the other veggies I'm using, or just all cabbage. Um, but I find if it gets too many of the other veggies, then it's not, it's not exactly as, um, as much of a sauerkraut as a, just a veggie ferment, which is also fine to do. Um, we'll leave off the kimchi and the pickle thing for now. Um, and then other favorite uh, kraut, sauerkraut cast of characters. These are in order of my favorites. Onions, carrots, beets, kohlrabi, daikon radish. There are probably others. People have used apples. I don't love using fruit in it, but some people really love the flavor of fruit. Some people put nuts in there. Um, and then some of the spices, I really love um, fresh raw ginger, caraway seeds, coriander seeds, fennel seeds, or fennel um, tops, and um, dill seeds, garlic um, grated or chopped, not usually, and then dried basil. Um, but usually I don't like the dried varieties of like ginger and um, fennel and garlic. I like to use those fresh and raw. And um, we'll get into this in a second. So the most important part of the ratios to remember is two to three tablespoons of salt to five pounds of veggies. Because what's happening when the ferment starts, what's happening, and come check this out. Here's five gallons I made this morning. I've packed the veggies into the crock, and what's happening is that the salt is, is um, forcing the water out of the cell walls of the veggies, and in a second I'll show you mixing this with the salt and pounding it. And that water is gonna rise, and the salt water is gonna keep the um, bacteria that wants to rot the food minimized and provide the correct environment for the lactobacilli and other beneficial bacteria to start their um, processes of fermenting. And it's gonna create a lactic acid kind of bath, salty lactic acid bath, which um, inhibits the growth of the molds and yeasts and um, bacteria that are trying to break down the food and rot it, which are also awesome superstars of the garden, but we like to leave them in the compost pile, not in the food. Um, and uh, when it's underneath the water, which I'll show you in a sec, that, uh, that environment that's perfect for the lactobacilli to do their work um, is also anaerobic. In other words, it doesn't let any oxygen into it. And so that minimizes the spectrum of what can live in there and work on that food. So the correct amount of salt is going to make uh, the tastiest ferment and also provide the correct environment for the fermentation to happen. So I'm hoping everybody's still with me. Mm -hmm. Where did I put my salt? So uh, I bought salt today for this, but we also we also hand harvest our own salt from the Puget Sound, um, going and collecting water, salt water out from near the islands or from the ocean and dehydrate it down. 
And for our year of food challenge, we only used salt that we hand harvested. I also like this mine salt. Alexia doesn't love the Redmond sea salt. Um, she loves, she, or the Redmond mine salt or the Himalayan salt as much. She likes the sea salt, I think. Is that true? Yeah, the, the, because I'm, made, I'm using my salt to make cheese and it just makes my cheese taste a little minerally. I love it. It's fine in kraut or soups or things, but not on cheese. That's a whole different kind of ferment. So I got my tablespoon scoop and my salt, but wait, I forgot to weigh the veggies and we got to know how much salt to use for this many veggies. I'm going to estimate this is about 12 pounds of veggies. Let's see how close I am. So we got our backer scale, or if you're doing a small enough batch to just use a, um, a, a countertop scale. Twelve pounds on the dot. All right. I can't see, but that's take all right for it. So I got to subtract the four pounds for the container. So that's eight pounds of veggies in there. Um, and for eight pounds of veggies, how much salt? Well, that was thunder. What's that? How much salt? Do the math in your head real quick. We'll go back to our ratio. Two to three tablespoons of salt to every five pounds of veggies. So it's gonna be about four tablespoons, four or five tablespoons. So we got um, three tablespoons for the first five pounds and then half of five pounds, tablespoon and a half. So we'll call it four tablespoons of salt for eight pounds of veggies. So I'm gonna measure out my salt. Sprinkle, measure, sprinkle, sprinkle. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's just a rough ratio. And then here's the fun part. If you got your, if you got children or um, anybody else who loves tactile process. Just getting all that salt mixed in with your veggies. So it's coating the veggies fairly equally. You could do this in a large bowl. You could do this in a, um, a big pot, like a stainless steel stock pot. Um, but you want to get your veggies nice and mixed and the salt really dispersed well. And then, this is a, not a mandatory step, but a helpful one, um, because it starts, it starts the breakdown process of the veggies. I, I made this um, homemade sauerkraut stomper out of a big round of maple and a handle, and I just pound, start pounding the veggies. going to start breaking down the cell walls and releasing the moisture as the salt is coating them and, and starting to um, drive the water out of the vegetables. Some recipes call for doing this for like eight or ten minutes. I do it for five, maybe less, maybe two minutes. And if you're at home, you might want to just use something like that in a bowl, you know, just found with a, a small wooden mallet and use a bowl. So I'm going to keep pounding just a little bit longer. Just, um, there's not really great light down here, but I'll lift it up to the counter so you can see just how gorgeous this food is. It's just beautiful, those colors.
So now what are we gonna put it in? So the best containers, um, I like these commercially made clay crocks because we, because we make uh, so much of it. So this is five gallons and very heavy. That's about 60 pounds. Um, most home fermenters don't need that much, but you can buy one of these that's a gallon, two gallons, three gallons or more, even bigger ones than this they make. Um, but for most folks, the easiest vessel to come up with is going to be a glass gallon jar or a two gallon glass jar. So this glass gallon jar is probably going to hold just about all those veggies. And um, just to show you our, another ferment that I made two or three days ago, here's just cabbage in a two gallon jar. And we'll come back to wait, waiting it um, and if you need a lid or not. But let's go pack this jar full. Any questions while I'm packing? Thank you. I just want to share we are at 147, so we just have around 13 or so minutes left. And um, yeah, if anyone has questions to share, we'd be so glad to hear. Um, it always makes the the video super interesting but you're doing such a great job covering like every process every question i've had is has been answered <laughs> great also it is hailing in woodenville very strongly right now for everyone at home. Yeah. i can hear it i've heard people wonder about making kraut without salt and i have done it it's um hasn't been as tasty or as long storing, but you can, you know, fluctuate the level of salt. Um, but the ratios Daniel mentioned are definitely the tried and true version. And it wants to be saltier in the summer, I've read, and um, less salty in the winter. And I think that's because of the temperature. Okay, so um, I have a little bit of extra which are gonna make a nice stir fry tonight with some meat or put it in a stew or even um, it could be like a salty coleslaw kind of salad. And I've got my gallon jar full, beautifully full. And I'm just gonna try to press it down as hard as I can. I could probably get another handful in here, but. I'm not going to try today because of um, I don't want to get this all done in an hour. And um, here comes some important considerations. Somebody before the call had um, asked a question about what are the common mistakes in home fermenting and how to avoid them. So one of the most common mistakes is in that I've made is improper ratio of veggies to salt, too salty or not salty enough. So I, hopefully I took care of that with the three to five ratio or two to five ratio. The second one is that is incorrect temperatures. So, um, and uh, so this, what's gonna happen next is that, um, actually I'll get to that in a moment on incorrect temperatures. Another, another important one is all of the veg all of the vegetable material needs to be underwater 100% of the time. So you see in this jar of sauerkraut that I pulled out of the refrigerator, the vegetable material is underwater. And the one I showed you over there, the two gallon one, the vegetables are underwater. And in this five gallon crock that I made earlier today, this morning, and in this one gallon crock that I'm about to show you, what I'm gonna do is after I pack the veggies, I'm gonna get some beautiful clean leaves and I'm gonna pack them in the top and make a kind of a shield layer that's gonna keep the veggies down underneath the water and it's gonna hold the weight. So watch, when I press this down, you may or may not be able to see it. It starts, all of the water that's being released by the veggies that are in the salt comes to the surface. And then I press 
it down with weights, beautiful stone, clean, boiled clean stone weights. And then the water comes up above the weights. You can see that violet color is the water above the weights. So in our gallon jar example, we've got a clean cabbage leaf. I'm using a different color cabbage leaf so you can see how it works. And I'm gonna tuck that around the edges. And over the next 24 to 48 hours, as the salt works its way into these veggies, they're gonna release water. And you can already see water, the liquid from the veggies is starting to rise as I pack it down. And you can see there's already some beautiful violet water on top. And um, over the next um, uh, 24 to 48 hours, that salt's driving the water out of the cellular structure of the plants. And so I need to weight it down. So a great at home option for this is just using a jar that fits inside your vessel, nice and tight, and using that cabbage leaf um, or some other vegetable matter that's gonna break down and um, just pressing it down. And this is going to release moisture, but if it, over the next 24 to 48 hours, if it doesn't get full with water, I'm going to add a little bit of sprinkle of salt and, a, and some non-chlorinated water or some of the juice from one of my old ferments, like um, this sauerkraut or these pickles. I'm going to just pour that and top that off on water. And I'm gonna put this inside a vessel that'll catch any overflow water so that I can save it and store it for later. So, because um, the, most common, the most common mistake is not having the water line above the veggie line and thereby letting um, oxygen, molds, yeast into touch and interface with that vegetable layer and start to rot it or mold it. So, the other important point was caring in caring for your cultures is the first week of the ferment, it needs to be 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'll just leave this in the kitchen like I showed you over on the counter over there with the different sizes of, of the crowds that are going for one week. And I'll watch the water level during that first week. And then after the fermentation starts happening because those lactobacilli are temperature um, their action is temperature related and when they start doing their job. So if I put it right in the refrigerator, it wouldn't ferment at all. It's too cold for the lactobacilli to start working. And um, if I put it somewhere too warm, like 90 or 100, it would start to rot because it's too warm. So I need to keep it about 60, 70 for the first five to seven days. For the next four to six weeks, it should be 40 to 50 degrees, like in a garage, or a basement or a un, you know like a closet or somewhere that's cooler uh, if you live in florida this might be harder to come come by mm -hmm. but around here it's pretty easy to come by and why don't i just show you our cold room really quick follow me so this is a cold, this is a cement floor unheated uninsulated space and i've got um five gallons of kraut that was made in September, and five gallons that was made in August. And um, for the next four to six weeks, up to six months, you wanna store uh, these crocs or your, your ferment in a cold place, in a cool 40 to 50 degree place, and um, check them. Because here's, I, I'm making one of the mistakes of um, sauerkraut uh, care, culture care, in that it's not topped off with water. So right after I get off with you, I'll pour some little bit of salt and some clean non-chlorinated water. And just to show you, um, that's not mold, that's just the, um, the byproducts of the top layer fermenting. Um, but if you do get mold, it's going to look like this down here. You can see this fermented veggie water exposed to the air. There's this kind of slimy mold. And if you find that on top of your ferment, all is not lost. It is 
okay because this stuff skims off. It's not um, toxic in that I've never gotten sick by eating it. And it, it skims off easily because one of the other most common mistakes that folks um, make is that they give up on their sauerkraut. Mm -hmm. They find a little bit of mold growing on the top because this is, there's live food in here and there's mold spores everywhere. There's yeast everywhere. There's bacteria everywhere in the environment and they're going to want to try to latch on to life in whatever way they can. So I've had people say, oh my gosh, there was mold on top and so I threw the whole batch away and I'm like, oh no. Um, actually underneath that first level, um, all of this food is, is good. So in about four to six weeks, this is going to have a little bit of a slimy layer, like about that thick in here. And you're going to have to scrape that layer off and do throw that in the compost. But down an inch or two right in here where all of these veggies have not been exposed to air, they've been covered in salt water because you did a really good job keeping your um, ferment wet enough all of this vegetable matter is really is good and is super tasty and my favorite krauts are usually at least a month old but between a month and a half and four months is is the tastiest and so then after it's um, fermented for that amount of time it comes out of the crock and goes into gallon jars with enough water to, to keep over the top and then it goes in the refrigerator so you can see that there's a batch made in July of the ginger kraut, and we've got four gallons in the fridge to eat, and there's pickles from um, August. Wow, that's a lot of talking. I wish I'd cleaned the fridge better. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our refrigerator. So where is that? Here we go. So, here I got, keep your salty water above your veggies. All food is always immersed. Check it once a week. Skim the mold, top off with a little salt and some water. And then after you like the taste, could be two weeks, could be six weeks, jar your sauerkraut up and put it in the refrigerator. So with this jar, it's, it's easy. We just scrape the top layer of the little bit that the mold and the, um, uh, that's starting to get a little soft and not super tasty. Give that to the chickens and ducks. They like it, they'll eat it. And then just screw your lid on there and put it in the refrigerator and the fermentation will slow down and stop when it's down at like 35 degrees, like in a refrigerator. And we're not even gonna get into kimchi or pickle brine because we're at about an hour. Mm -hmm. So are there any questions at this point? Thank you so much. We do have a question from Jacqueline. If you don't have weights, can you just pack with veg in the glass jar? So um, what happens, it, oh, is that the end of the question? Or? No, that, or yes, that was it. Um, so what happens is if I just leave this just like this and like, let's say that I just screwed the lid on, what happens is all of this just migrates up. It just floats up to the top and um, the water, it's not pressed down into the water. So it's hard to keep the water level above those veggies. So you're gonna lose more if you don't weight it. You're gonna lose anything that's interfacing with the air mm -hmm. and anything that's, in, uh, uh, that's accessible by the mycelia of the mold that are mm -hmm. trying to feed off of that. So, um, I would put a plastic bag full of water, a clean scrubbed stone, or a jar full of water to weight it down. I would weight it with something. And don't seal it completely because the fermentation off gases. I don't know if you've Burps. ever had um, a kombucha bottle explode in the kitchen or the apple cider do a volcano number. We want to let fermentation breathe. And is it going to be breathing for, um, for those four to six weeks? Yep. So what happens on these, um, what happens on these crocs is that there's a beautiful water seal right here that lets the air, the off-gassing come out with pressure, but doesn't let any oxygen go in. So these 
little moats. Wow, you can see that after 48 hours, it's topped all the way up with um, the water that's coming out. So these little moat containers are super handy for fermenting, or there's air locks that you can put on a, on a gallon jar lid, or you can use, um, you can just leave it uh, open to the air. But yes, it's gonna be off gassing while it's fermenting. It'll slow down, it's most in the first week, but yeah. Thank you. Wow, this was so beautiful to witness and, and I love seeing the various mm -hmm. stages of the, um, the sauerkraut through finished product, through the one you just showed us with the um, 48 hours later and um, this was just a really fantastic class. Thank you so much. And yeah, you're welcome. So there's a lot I didn't mention. <laughs> and um, one thing I would like to mention in closing, keep following me here, if you would, is um, I learned a lot of what I know from this book. And I recommend it as a single um, pretty good resource for some of the background of fermenting and a lot of really awesome recipes. So Sander Elix Katz, Wild Fermentation is a great resource. Um, that is the and best book. That's what I, just, I've learned from them too, a little bit. <laughs> what he says is just try it, like experiment. You can't really, you're probably not going to hurt yourself with this process. Just try it um, and um, go for it. Like it, it's doable and it's easy and it's delicious. And if you make a mistake, just feed it to the chickens and start over. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you guys, this is so beautiful. Thank you again for, for teaching us and for everyone who was able to join us today. Join us um, for our other virtual events. Oh, so good to see you both. Um, yeah. jo join us for next month's um, awesome Gizzards, Giblets, and Bones Oh My class <laughs> where we learn about yeah. um, how, to, how to use the whole animal in, um, in cooking and we have other virtual education events with Hawthorne Farm on our virtual education page. And we'll send a follow-up email to all of you with some resources for you, like this wild fermentation book, amazing, and um, have some more links and, and resources to prepare you. But you've all been so Thanks. great. Thank you, Rian. Really appreciate you hosting and your um, presence and questions mm -hmm. and um, Make, make a lot of difference for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, it's always Thanks. a pleasure. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Happy kraut making, everybody. Enjoy. Bye. Bye. Yum ferments. Yum.